looking at Friday, but we're trying to find an earlier time. Okay. So. Okay. okay. I mean, I, I don't want to stop. No, no. it's just going to be the same <laughs> meeting. We're trying to capture okay. as many That's people, <laughs> so it's fine. It's the okay. same material. So you send it to two, two, one. I don't know who we have to Yeah, it's just uh, we're we're working through his office to try sure. to Okay. That's the end Hi, I'm Veronica. Hi, Sharice. 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 Hi, Sharice.
It identified an 84 square mile boundary and it was a place-based strategy that says basically if you build here, you automatically get these fee waivers. There wasn't any protections on the type of development in that boundary, except it had exclusions for like financial institutions, like predatory lending, um, had um, liquor sales, those types of um, establishments that aren't neighborhood serving. Um, and so it has been successful. We've issued about 11,000 fee waivers since its creation in 2010, and it has facilitated the construction of over 10,000 housing units within that 84 square mile area of which 42% were considered affordable. Now, this um, something that I want to stress is that even if you're not in this 84 square mile area, the, you are still eligible to receive the fee waivers if you're an affordable housing project. That's what the policy says today, yes. Can I stop you? How do you define what you mean by affordable in this context? Not in this. This is the old policy. The oh, new okay. policy will go that. I'm talking about the, the current policy, so <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Okay. And so what we're recommending is that we change it and we call it the City Fee Waiver Program. And we focus less on where we want the development to occur, but the type of development we want. And so the only establishments that would be eligible to receive fee waivers would be affordable housing, and I'll define that. In the next slide, owner-occupied rehab. We heard that there was a lot of need for that through the Mayor's Housing Task Force public meetings. Historic rehabilitation, and then business, business development and legacy development. And so it's no longer a place space within that 84 square mile area. We've eliminated the boundary and we've said, you're only gonna get a fee waiver if you're affordable housing, owner-occupied rehab housing, historic rehab or business development. And what this does is it really prevents someone from going into a neighborhood, purchasing a couple lots, and building multifamily for-profit development. And so we were able to provide some level of neighborhood protection by limiting the types of uses that you can use for the fee waivers. Now affordable housing, it's only available for nonprofits or private developers whose mission is to construct affordable housing and you have to be qualified by our Housing and Neighborhood Services Department. So Barrow Soto and their team, they know our for-profit and not-for-profit developers. Um, they can review their mission and they can tell us, yes, they do meet this mission and they have to have at least 50% of those units at affordable and the rate needs to be at least 25% at or below 60% AMI or 25% at or below 80%. And that's citywide. The The old policy, affordable, was basically um, the 50% under 80%. I mean, it really was loosely defined. We've, we've created a more strict definition, and this is in alignment with the needs of the house, housing task force. We see that there is a greater need for the 60% or below, but there is still a need um, for the 80% or below for that workforce. Um, so we are promoting that this is the, at, at minimum, you have to have this product type to be able to get the fee waivers. And what you would receive is up to $250,000 in your SAS fee waivers and up to 100% um, of your city fee waivers, which isn't capped, it's, it is what it is. It's usually about 1% of your project cost. Um, and then the I defined affordable for the rental. The affordable for the for sale is between 60 and 120 percent AMI. And that's the sweet spot as defined in the mayor's housing task force report. Um, the owner occupied. Do you have a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So are you using the HUD or the, the HUD? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Which acronym is for San Antonio Properties? Is that what the HUD is? Yes. Yes. And so we had a large discussion with us and nonprofit housing developers want us to use the HUD because that allows them to layer the other incentives. And so Habitat for Humanity, um, Alamo Group, all of them are requesting we need to use the HUD standards because when they are accessing federal tools and federal loans, that's the standards they use. So we make it more difficult when we don't use that. Sure, but couldn't we lower them to reflect what the true point is? We've looked at that, but we are going to keep it at the at these levels 
Um, but we'll, we will be measuring it to make sure that we're meeting certain goals. What is HUD AMI 100% versus it's, San Antonio? Um, San Antonio is like 50? 80, San Antonio at 80% would be 100%. No. Well, give me numbers. 80 so 100% AMI in San Antonio is around 55, right? Yeah. So what is HUD? So in San Antonio, if you're looking well, at HUD, is about stock, 64, I think, and then 80% of that is 48. Okay. Correct? Uh, what I know is 80% for the San Antonio MSA is more than 100% for San Antonio City. Yes. Okay. And what I was explaining is that we've, we've worked with a lot of nonprofit housing developers. They're requesting LIS, um, Prudential, um, Alamo Group, Habitat for Humanity. They've requested we stick with what HUD wants. So if and I'm because, but we are still going to be measuring the impact, but we are not going to. That's we, we want to have the same guidelines as HUD. So I hire a homeowner on the west side, a legacy working on working family. How does that fit in with the fact that now you have HUD and but I'm not a HUD? So, so no, the HUD has nothing to do. Like, you don't have to have your project. Your HUD doesn't have to be involved in your project. It's just they're using the same guidelines that HUD uses. I don't know how that so, works. So, so what she's saying is we're, they're going to use HUD because they're mandated to use it. But, you know, some of us, some of the position is that it's not really affordable by local standards. And so if it says 80%, for, when they say 80% AMI, what they're really saying by local standards is 100% higher. So, so I have a, just to give some broad some numbers. If you're looking for a family of four, the HUD guideline at 80% is 53,440. That's based on 2018 numbers. So that's twice the average family income on the west side. 12,000. And if you were to use the city guidelines, 80% family of four, city of San Antonio, it's 46,000, almost 754. So there's a difference. So there. if I could get through the policy, the uh, so you can under because I think some well, of your questions will be answered. Well, just one other thing though. Know, how long is this in place? So they if they they might open. Uh, okay, we're doing affordable housing. But is it in perpetuity? It's like, for the term of their agreement. So typically it's ten or fifteen years. So what, what are we doing? At the end of fifteen years, it goes market rate. We we're not going to be monitoring. Yeah. Right. It's term of the agreement. What and happens if it's sold? If it's so a for-profit? So, so I want to make sure, we're talking about fee waivers. We're not talking mm -hmm. about oh. any tax rebates or anything. So it's gone. This they is, it, this it. is, this is fee waivers. Once we get into the tax rebates and things like that, that's a different policy. The fee waiver policy, what we're doing is we're eliminating the opportunity for that market rate housing developer to go into neighborhoods, buy homes, Knock them down and build a multifamily market rate project. Say something else. I'm saying we're eliminating that. But so what? You want that? Saying, no, she's saying we don't want it to get yeah, that's the goal. Yeah. Just we, not we, we don't that want happen. that to happen. So that's the goal of this. So this is just strictly the fee waiver program. This is not the CETA program. The fee waiver program is a fee waiver program that provides fees to help redevelop certain areas. One time only. One time only. And it's a small amount, um, up to 250000 in fee waivers. And we're saying you can have that provided you meet a definition of affordability. Owner-occupied rehab, you get the fee waivers. If, you're, if you are going through one of our repair <coughs> rehab programs that the Housing and Neighborhood Services Department or one of our nonprofit providers, sponsors. This is something new. We didn't have that in the other one. And this is something we heard that people, if they were trying to improve their home, um, they need they would like access to the fee waivers, and they were getting assistance from the city to be able to stay in their home. So this is something new that we've added to this program. The lot, the other one is historic rehab. If you were doing a historic rehab, and I think you, I think were you the yeah, one who right, said yeah. it's um, you have to be eligible to be designated. You do not have to be designated. Okay. I see okay. that you added that language. Yeah, we added that language mm -hmm. um, because we don't want, um, some people don't want to be designated. Um, and then the last one is something that um, Rene Dominguez and his team is working on. And
is that something we need to address? Why don't you let's talk about that? What is the issue? That, that's uh, eligible to be designated as historic. You can see where it is. If the structure is eligible, eligible to be designated as historic, so we can clarify that if you're concerned about the district. Because that there's, there's parts of the west side that, that should mm -hmm. be, if I'm saying this right. Mm -hmm. So um, we're making sure that that, there, that that historic area is eligible. So do you want the area, the entire area, eligible? I don't think you do. For I'm historic or for <laughs> leeway? Well, I, I, I mean, it's not a conversation right now. Yeah. I, I'd like to talk about it. But because historic, uh, so does I'm it have to be on the path to historic, for no, example? You, you don't have to have it designated. It needs to be eligible to be designated. Eligible, so that like means eligible criteria. for legacy. Mm -hmm. I'm eligible for, so 50 years or older. So if you were to build, re, redevelop your home in Menke Park, mm -hmm. but it's not designated, and you were going through one of our... But my okay. house was built in 37. Yeah, yeah so... Yeah, but not everything has to be 50 to be uh, eligible. There are other ways to be eligible. If you, it's, if there's a cultural significance and it goes mm -hmm. through the process. So it's the whole west side. The whole west side. We will... We will it, so are you saying you want the whole west side to be eligible, or you only want structures... I'm, I'm trying to understand. So are you saying um, that you want all the west side to be eligible for this um, this part of the fee waiver of the fee waiver program? Yes. Regardless okay. of use. So if they're gonna build a liquor store in a building that can be redeveloped, you want them to get fee waivers. If it's a historic if building. If it's a historic building. Or I, mean, the, I mean the the, the, the way historic designation mm -hmm. works is we don't get to Dictate what kind of business you put there, but but if it's eligible, but if it's eligible for for um, historic, say you've got this building and it's it's eligible, mm -hmm. and um, somebody wants to put in a liquor store <coughs> there and they want to get the fee waiver. Mm -hmm. Do you want that? Not that so much that do you not want that considered historic, but do you want that person to get the fee waiver? Well, see, to me, <coughs> I, I I feel like if you if you think that's a problem. Then there's a problem with the policy. No, I don't think that's a problem. I'm just I'm hearing com I'm hearing conflicting, where some want it to be more strict and some want it to be open, and so I have it drafted as if if it's eligible to be designated and someone's going to go and invest in that property, they should get the fee waiver. That's how it's drafted. Would a liquor store be eligible otherwise? I don't. I'm, there are certain classifications, I don't know if a liquor store, but there are certain Like a restaurant would that serve liquor? Yes. But a convenience yeah. store or a, um, you know, a convenience store that, or a liquor store or they would also be up. It does, it's not dependent on the business. It doesn't say, it just says owners of residential commercial structures, so there's no okay. restrictions on the kind of business that's okay. there. That's what I'm confused. Yeah. Just, just three numbers, when 7-Eleven wanted to buy the malt house, which was designated historic, mm -hmm. they said they couldn't deal with that building, that they had to tear it down to go their 7-Eleven. Even though there's a 7-Eleven and historic building in downtown San Antonio, even though there are 7 Elevens and historic buildings all over New England. But they said on the west side, oh no, we can't put our 7 Eleven in a historic building. We have to knock it down and build a generic looking 7 Eleven. So perhaps if this had been in place, they would have not knocked down the mall house and instead put their 7 Eleven in the mall house. Well, they would have got the fee waiver for it. That's an issue of historic designation and how much control it's historic has over demolition. preventing demolition, which is separate from this program. So can I ask a quick question about clarification? So it says maximum fee waiver based on business eligibility criteria. So is there, I guess that's where I'm confused, is there a criteria that's for so, some, not for others? Like and that is, so for the historic rehab, that's mm -hmm. what we're focusing on now. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very loose on that one, okay. for, but there is a larger program that Renee Dominguez is working on that will come back and talk about okay. the eligibility and where it goes in the regional centers. That's in alignment with the regional centers, okay. and that's taking a separate path than this. Now, the one thing that's part of the business development is if you're a legacy business, as qualified by historic preservation, um, so you go through and I think it's more than 20 years, you're eligible for the fee waivers to expand. Um, so that that is something that we've incorporated in our side. Renee Dominguez is currently working on the regional center classification and looking to see, you know, is it small business development that gets certain fee waivers in certain areas, 
um, there's industry development, so that's taking a separate path. But um, we're focusing primarily on affordable housing, the owner-occupied rehab, the historic rehab, and then the legacy business. But right now, it's drafted as if you're eligible for designated, you're putting a, um, a restaurant in there, you get it. You don't have to be designated, but you would be eligible because we want someone to invest in that building. We want them to invest in that area. So you're right. You're, the entire west side would basically be eligible to be designated. Um, this I wanted to stress on the housing side. This is something that we learned a lot through our neighborhood discussions. We had initially said um, if you are going to be doing a short-term rental in your housing development, you would not be eligible for the fee waiver program. And um, when we went through some neighborhood associations, they said, well, wait a minute, I rent a room um, and I live in the house and that helps me make my housing payment. And so what we've done <coughs> is we've said that you're ineligible for a short-term rental permit if you're a type two property, which is non-owner occupied, it's an investment. And so we're allowing type one properties where <coughs> I rent my my room in Mankey Park, I live there, that's helping me make ends meet. And so I want to stress these changes are really made to help with that neighborhood preservation component because we saw a lot of people going in, getting their fees waived for, for zoning to redevelop some market rate housing on two or three lots in a neighborhood. And we're saying <coughs> you can't do that. If you're going to redevelop housing, it has to meet our affordable definition and or it has to be under one of our affordable housing owner occupied rehab programs that are either done through housing and neighborhood services or through one of our nonprofit partners. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards because I just want to make sure I understand. So if I have a building on the west side, it's historic, but it's not designated historic, and somebody comes in, a, you know, a liquor store just mm -hmm. to make it, and you we get a fee waiver, do they have to follow? You know, do they have to go to HDRC or OHP to make sure that building is restored in according with its history, or can they just restore it anyway? They it, it, if they go through, so the OHP process for, for designation, if it's eligible to be designated, even sometimes, I think this happened with the 7 no, well, actually, was the 7 Eleven already designated? I don't recall. A mall house was, was designated was it, okay. in 2013. Okay. And two years later, 7-Eleven mm -hmm. wanted to buy the property. Okay. So the malt house was already designated. So let's say the malt house wasn't designated. Um, someone could apply for it to get designated. And then it has to go through a hearing. And that goes through HDRC and then that goes to council. Um, you're talking about an individual property yes. rather than a historic district. So yes. it's just the property. Right. Yes, we're only talking about the So there would be no... Uh, HOP to so tell me I have to have purple on the outside. As so we, they would not get the fee waiver unless it was gone through that process. No, it could. So let's say oh, you. Sorry. Have, uh, no, it's not. It's a, yeah. it's so let's say you have a house and it's over 50 years old. It's not designated. You want to do some renovations. Um, Shannon Miller's office will say yes, it's eligible for designation. They won't initiate the designation process, but they just want. We want someone to live in the neighborhood. We want people to invest in the neighborhoods. Um, and so we would grant them the fee waiver. Now that does not preclude, what's your name? Jen. Jen from going and filing an application for it to be designated. And if that were to happen, it would go through the process. But if that doesn't happen. Okay, but if it doesn't happen, will Jen have to adhere to certain? No, if it doesn't happen. She can so, tear it down. But she would still get the historic credits even though she's not agreeing not, to the historic guidelines? This, it, this isn't for historic credits. This is just for just the fee waiver. No, but I mean, she would get the, the, the historic fee rehab fee waiver even though she's not following the historic She items. would get the SAWS water fee waiver in the city. Even fee waiver. Because, for because the building is eligible, not because it's not because it's designated, but because it's because some eligible. individuals don't want to designate. Say her property is eligible. It's, it's 75 years old, but it's not designated. So she gets the waiver, but she decides she wants to demolish it. And because it's not designated, there's no restrictions on the demolishing. Then she demolishes it and builds something entirely different. What's to prevent that from happening? And so if she demolishes it, let's say it's, it's historic rehab. She demolishes it. She's not rehabbing the home. 
No, she's it's not. You so have to keep the property. So how do you, you've already she's given the Rehab fee. versus reconstruction. <coughs> so she, she has to rehab. What, what if it's rehabbed in a that? way that's not historically present? Mm -hmm. And applying for this because they're eligible to apply for it, but then they don't have to follow any particular guidelines because there's no historic designation. And that's what we don't want. So how, how do we prevent that part from happening? And so we, we'll work with the Office of Historic Preservation because they're the ones who would have to approve the project falling under these criteria. And so when they submit for eligibility, they have to show what they're they're doing as well. Okay. And so it is rehab versus new construction. Um, we could put some strings attached as we get permits. And so we can get back to you on the more like more details on how Shannon's office will monitor that. So the control but, would be by the permit. Yes. Okay. And, and then we can always have a recapture opportunity where after they build it, we go back okay. and if they didn't do what they said they were going to do, then we recapture the fee. Well, it also could be for owner occupied yes. or intended owner occupied. Because mm -hmm. that gets away from the current investment properties. Right. Yeah, and for owner occupied, it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, the, seeing mm -hmm. our neighborhood being bought up by investors, oh, and, cool. I mean, the only yeah. thing that's protecting it is the historic designation. <laughs> so I because I was, I mean, what I have heard from the neighborhood was exactly what Pete said. Mm -hmm. Some people just don't want right. to get designated. Sure. Um, and that makes sense, and I wouldn't try to push a neighborhood to become designated. I just want to make sure that we're not inadvertently giving fee waivers to investors who are going to tear down or completely change a historic house that was only eligible because it was historic. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure there's a control in there. Do a bad so flip and get fee waivers. For yeah, that. exactly. A bad flip. That's a perfect example. A really bad flip and getting, you know, that's exterior. Honestly, what they do to the interior, I don't care. But the exterior, um, if it's not truly, um, if I want to be able to support the, the person living in the house, not necessarily the investor that just wants to flip a house. I think we can find a policy solution yeah. to that. Okay. I think we want to avoid the situation where, you know, my grandmother wants to have her house redone and there's a sauce fee right. waiver and she can't get that fee waiver even though the home is old and we have right. to rehab it. And she goes through that process, but now there's a long-term commitment where she can convert or demo her home even though it might be 10 years later. We don't want to put some sort of long-term tie on a fee waiver that was up front, not for a, not for an individual homeowner. You know, I think that's, that's handcuffing that homeowner a little bit too much. And if it's a store property, those are way different. But I don't think this is the mechanism really to put that sort of handcuff um, or restriction um, on an individual homeowner. Um, but I think there's a policy solution that we can look at on their historic rehab for investors. Um, I think we can find a solution there, I'm pretty certain. And just, just to clarify one more time, we're not actually offering incentives for the rehab work. It's just a waiver of the fees. They right. would still have to fund them. Um, right. Owner-occupied rehab does, through Housing and Neighborhood Services or through those nonprofits, they actually provide funds to also help with the rehab. Mm -hmm. um, but the historic, it's really just the mm -hmm. So realistic, this is going to be like a sales fee waiver for a homeowner. It's going to be like putting an addition onto the house that requires... Curiously, the SOS fee waiver isn't going to be an issue for an existing home. Yeah. It's the city fee waiver when you're right. extending right. your home and things like that. Right. New roof, maybe. And so it's it's not the SOS, it's going to be used. Well, it's any of the, the fee waiver. So, as a homeowner, what would I expect? Say I was not historic mm -hmm. and I wanted to, I have a, but I have a historically eligible home, I want to put on an addition to my house. Um, how would this program, the fee waiver program, so it's typically we'll give, so um, when I did my home, first of all, I, I didn't get any fee waivers, even though I was eligible, I want to make sure they're very clear. Um, but when I rehab my home, um, you, you know, I paid probably about two to five thousand dollars in fees um, for the extension, the complete rehab. If you were to do that, what they would do is they'll grant you a letter and you give that to your contractor or whoever's doing your home. When they go to pay the fees, they, they share that letter and say I'm redeveloping this home and they don't charge you that. Fees like permit fees? Permit yeah. fees. Okay, thank you. Because yeah. I actually just did a thousand square foot addition on our home and it's historic and we didn't pay five thousand dollars. You would qualify <laughs> under the owner occupied rehab 
I didn't get Section any of waivers. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so that's another problem. People don't know about the waivers as well. So. Yeah. But that would be, you would get a letter, your developer, or whoever's doing your home, or whoever your contractor is, he has that. Mm -hmm. And when he goes to development services, um, he either shares that letter or they look up in the system. So the permit fees would be? Yes, and that's right. typically okay. how we catch that's... and monitor is through permitting. Okay. And what this does, it just simply lowers your cost to rehab your house. Okay. So. I just hope that you're working closely with OHP so that this program can be packaged with what they already have. Because, I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. this is okay, but if you get your, uh, for new designations, the benefit for a new designation is far better than this. And that's mm -hmm. why we want that to go through OH because this isn't upfront, it's basically cash off the overall project cost. It would be monitored within that year. And if they don't do what they did, they either don't get the disbursement or they have to pay it. So the city fee waiver program, um, you know, our goal is really to kind of focus on the development needs of the community, um, prioritize housing affordability and um, affordable housing for owner-occupied rehab programs, preserve and protect neighborhoods through unwanted development and type 2 short-term rentals, support our other city policies, SA Tomorrow and the Mayor's Housing Task Force. And then we also heard that we want, um, a lot of people were concerned when they went to, like Habitat for Humanity is a great example. They do homes within a year, like they can build a home within six months, easy. And so they will come back to us and say, I need a fee waiver, well, we're out of fee waivers for that year. And so what we've done is we develop protected pots of funding that will be for affordable housing. And then we have a fund for historic rehab. Then we have a fund for the, the seed chip. That way, we can cover that affordable housing component. And then we're going to try to leave some wiggle room to where, let's say that affordable housing needs more money, but we have money in the seed chip. We can do some transferring. But it was something to where you didn't have two large industry development projects or downtown housing projects that would come in and eat up that entire fund, and there wasn't anything left. So um, we work very closely on that, and I'll talk more about that on um, budget allocation later on. Um, the next one, hey Christine, you, you came in a little late. Um, no, it's okay. I'm glad you're here. Um, Veronica Soto is going to be, she's working on her, the, the affordable housing strategy. And that's going to be coming to council in June of 2019. The affordable housing strategy is going to be addressing, you know, the Mayor's Housing Task Force report and looking at the strategy to meet those goals and it'll look at the low income housing tax credit 9% 4% it'll look at the CDBG home the neighborhood improvement our RSA programs all of that it'll include the C chip and it'll include the iCRIP the iCRIP and the C chip we, we the iCRIP today I think um, there's more concerns about the neighborhood preservation component with how the iCRIP works right now and so we wanted to go forward and fix that. And then the C chip is on the moratorium. No development has occurred downtown. And so we needed to go forward and, and um, amend that policy. The other policy, they're going to be coming back in June. And it'll be a very comprehensive policy. So I don't want people to confuse the C chip and ICRIP as the affordable housing strategy for the city of San Antonio. Um, and so well, we developed the economic development strategy, which is a seed chip. The real, the thought behind it was, you know, you want to create a 24-7 um, neighborhood. You do that by creating housing. Um, more housing provides more disposable income. More disposable income creates the neighborhood that, um, so it creates that retail that you need to support a neighborhood. And then once you create that retail that's more in line with neighborhood support services versus hotel, then you've created a neighborhood where employers want to go. And so it, it helps us overall with our economic development strategy. Um, so it was not focused on housing alone. It was how do we redevelop our downtown that has an imbalance of 14,000 housing, 14,000 hotel rooms and only 3,300 housing units. And it's basically tourist driven, all of our retail. You'll never have a problem finding a coonskin cap or a coffee mug with the Casa Rio umbrellas on it. But if you need food, um, you need a grocery store, 
um, you need daycare, those services aren't downtown. And so the thought was <coughs> saturate it with that housing, that'll help promote those retail services to create the neighborhood. Um, the next slide, um, just want to stress that downtown housing development is challenging. You all know this who live in downtown neighborhoods. The, the land prices are higher, two to three times higher than in other markets. Um, construction costs are higher because of parking garages versus surface parking lots. You have historic buildings that we want to preserve and that, that is more costly. Um, you have zoning requirements like the river improvements overlay that requires you to give so much sunlight to our river, which requires you to change your design. Um, rental rates that we have don't support the land prices. Um, we have aged public infrastructure, and then the shapes are not nice and square or rectangular. They're, they're triangular. Um, they're very challenging shape parcels. So it, it's just really challenging to develop in downtown, and that's why we needed the incentives. So in 2012, City Council approved the as of right incentive package and it provided city and SOS fee waivers um, on an as of right basis and those were funded through the general fund that is the city fee waivers and the SOS fee waivers SAWS appropriate spending annually the tax reimbursement grant was only on your ad valorem taxes that the developer paid so it's not the city general fund taxes it's the developer they pay their taxes they get them reimbursed um, we provided a low interest loan or grant based on um, a level of units or affordability and that those were all done as of right so basically if you build two or more housing units in this area you automatically get this um, it was successful um, we provided 1.4 billion dollars in investment 102 million dollars of incentives the majority of that was the tax rebate so of that 122 million 75 percent of it is a tax rebate the rest were the fee waivers and the loans 17 million or 17, about 25 million were SAWS fee waivers and then the rest were the city fee waivers and the, the city loan. So very little general fund dollars went in to help support these, these units. So it was primarily the tax rebates. Um, we helped facilitate 6,800 housing units of which 23% were affordable. Um, we have retail and 28,000 square feet of office. Um, the housing that was developed also helped create um, or redevelop properties <coughs> along with the So we had brownfield sites with real or perceived environmental contamination. You had seven sites that were on the vacant building registry program that have been vacant for years. And you also had 13 sites that were in surface parking lots. So the incentives did help redevelop properties <coughs> that otherwise would not have been developed. Um, and then there was also an annual net revenue to the city or the community as a result of these and so even though we are foregoing quite a bit of taxes um seisd after all these projects are developed will receive 16.2 million dollars in taxes annually and then after the rebates burn off the total um, taxes and after they grow because we're doing a inflation rate of two percent every year SASD will get 23.5 million. So it's going to help the, the school district. Um, the city of San Antonio, our investment year one, um, will get 2.2 million in city taxes, which is about six times more than we're getting before the properties are developed. And then year 16, after the rebates expire, we're getting 10.1 million. So we are getting a high return on the investment. And what the city invested was we were foregoing about 5.7 million annually, but the project returns about 30.9 million dollars annually to the community as a result of what it's paying to the school districts and the city of San Antonio and the other tax benefits. So there is a large return. Do you have a question? I do. Um, so what if the properties that receive these incentives are sold before year 60? What if they're sold in three years or four So it depends years? on who they're sold to. And so if right now it reads that if you sell, so like NRP, um, they had um, is it Blue Star. Mm -hmm. um, so they sell their property. Um, the, if they don't sell it to a subsidiary, um, then either council has to proactively reassign the contract, so it has to go to council, or the, the contract is terminated. So 
correct? Uh, it's, we could do an administrator. It, we, we can. We can assign an administrator. Mm -hmm. with. But all of the provisions within the agreement have to, have to pass on. So they have to, you know, meet whatever criteria was set on the original agreement. They have to submit all the paperwork that was set in the original agreement. Um, and if they don't want to do that, then the in, the tax rebates would expire. They wouldn't get the money. So if they sold the project in year four, the rest of the tax rebates would go to the project because they wouldn't have agreed to assign all of the provisions in the contract. But if they make money on the sale of the property and they don't continue that tax agreement, does the city make any of that money back? Because essentially the city is an investor in these projects, and so how are they recovering that investment if the property is sold before the term? For getting the taxes after that. So if they sell it at year four, they start paying taxes year five. Or we keep their taxes. We keep all of them five. instead of rebating them to the developer. Okay. But what they about the first four years where you weren't getting any? They, they keep those. I mean, they still, they're, they're paying their taxes. We're rebating the portion that the city would have kept. They, they keep that rebate. And so that is our investment for them taking the risk to develop the site. But they're not getting the rest of the rebate. And we've got the housing units. All the other taxing entities get paid taxes at the higher rate versus the pre-developed costs. So what if they were, the rest of the chart seems mm -hmm. the same. But what if they were supposed to be reserved for affordable housing units? And then they sell it, and the new owner is going to use them at the market rate. Before so that's that not in this that's policy right now. So this is the old policy. We're speaking to the okay. current. So right now, if someone under the old policy, I mean, we don't have those provisions right. in that's, there. So okay. Um, I may have to. Oh, sorry, because I have to pick sorry. up my kids from school. Mm -hmm. um, so can we speak to the new policy? Yeah, sure. Can you address those questions? Yeah, like sure. those same questions, are they going to be addressed yeah, in the new policy? Yeah, sure. What? I, I would like to talk about the new policy. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I, I mean, the old policy is yeah. great, but I, I want to know what oh, the new policy is going to do to address these questions. Okay. So let's go to slide um, eight. So, well, actually, slide um, page eight, slide 15. Is that what you mean? Proposed teacher? Okay. And so, what we're recommending is we're extending the program for two years and then reevaluate the market and the incentives. And we're going to align the policy with SA Tomorrow planning efforts, the Mayor's Housing Task Force recommendations, and focus on density and affordability. What we've done is removed any area that has urban low density residential and medium density residential from the boundaries. So if it's a neighborhood, it's not eligible for the seat chip center. So if, if you are a single family neighborhood, even though you, you appear to, you're in the boundary, you're not zoned, you're not eligible because you're not zoned to Your be able to receive these not. incentives. The land use is not yeah. consistent. So you cannot, so no one can buy, go in your neighborhood, buy homes, and get these incentives. Um, and then what we did is for the downtown area, we created two levels and, mark, and looked at the market rate supply, the rental rate as attainment, and the land prices. And then for um, the regional centers, we, we have a, a different. Um, formula will be using, and we'll go with that, as well as transportation corridors. So we have two boundaries, or two, uh, three tiers that we're looking at. Level one is basically the central business district. You'll get a higher amount of incentives. Level two are the adjacent um, areas around downtown. You'll get a little bit less incentive. And then level three are the SA Tomorrow Regional Centers. Um, Something to note about the SA Tomorrow Regional Centers, you're not eligible to receive any incentives if you're in the SA Tomorrow Regional Center until City Council has adopted your land use plan that has gone through the community process. And so we want to make sure that we're in line with what the community wants to see for land use. So Tiers 1 and Tier 2, those will be available immediately. Tier 3, as those land use plans get adopted, then you'd be eligible. Can you tell me how many of the regional centers have gone through? I know that the Midtown has definitely any, have any of the other ones. Midtown and Downtown are the two that are probably the furthest. Okay. Um, but then they the rest, been they haven't been adopted yet. The rest, um, like Brooks is probably the next closest, mm -hmm. and that won't get adopted until this um, spring. The spring. It's projected for but Midtown is supposed to go to council in January. Right. That'll be one of the and so we, we wanted to make sure that these any incentives are in aligned with the land use that the community decides <coughs> for that community. 
decision-making process. Um, so let's go to um, the bottom of slide nine, page nine, slide 18. Um, so you have to be in the boundary, and which means you have to be zoned appropriately. Uh, All projects are subject to design review, regardless of them being designated as historic. So if you're going to receive any incentives through this policy, you have to go through the Historic and Design Review Commission so they can review the design. Even if it's not in the historic district? Yes. Okay, still it's still um, and then projects require rezoning from single family residential or not eligible um, unless later on through the um, SA Tomorrow planning efforts, those regional centers, the community specifically rezones that single family. Do something. I don't know where that would happen, but we didn't want to to say never. To say never. So if the community says yes, that shouldn't be zoned single family, and it gets rezoned, then it would be eligible. So, so there's a lot of properties on the west side and in our neighborhood as well that they're zoned um, multifamily, but they're actually single family homes sitting on them. And How would that provision that speaks to existing use? So if okay. you are zoned A, but in uses B, such as single family. We would say if there's a single family dwelling on this site, regardless of zoning, um, then that would mean you could not knock down that single family. And if it was like an MS-33 in a, in a urban low density neighborhood, which that exists a lot, it's not eligible because of the land use. Right. Okay. But perhaps it was in a higher density area, but the existing condition as a single family, exactly what you described, we are putting language in the policy. That's come up from a couple of other okay. folks as well. Yeah. Kind of Good part of the west uh, west side plus Manatee Park and uh, Government Hill. It's all at MF 33. Mm -hmm. With single family. But you With single family. family. Yeah. Yeah. Same. So those would be health. protected. Yeah, until we know. And then um, these are the density requirements. I'm not going to read those to you. <laughs> You're ineligible for a short-term rental permit type two. Um, agreements will be posted to a public online database. Um, projects including a hotel component are not eligible. And so if you're building condos on top and a hotel, you would not be eligible for the as of right and something. The online database, is that going to be accessible through the city's website? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. The uh, luxury unit, there's been a lot of concern about and sending luxury, so we're putting caps. This is something we presented to council. Um, luxury units, so the for sale, any for sale product over three hundred sixty thousand dollars would not receive a fee. Would not receive. Would not be eligible. Would not be eligible. Yes, and the reason why three hundred sixty is that's based on the amount of Federal Housing Administration mortgage loan. That's the largest amount you could get, um, and so. Most of the townhomes, with the exception of Terramark, like Charlie Turner of the Terramark towns, would be ineligible. Um, and but this would allow those his his townhomes and products like that are like three bedroom, two bath. They're great for families. It's providing they meet the density. That's good. Anything above that, so anything like the five hundred thousand dollar condos or four million dollar condos, they're not eligible. And that um, changes, and FHA rate changes each year. So that's something we can tie to federally. Correct. Right. Um, so there's kind of a concern under the requirements for level two, which is going to be on the west side. This is 20% board units and or five stories in height. Provided it's zoned appropriate. This there's, doesn't. There's no buildings that top of the west side. That would just be insane. That no one would ever build it if it's. So, well, I wouldn't put it past. I mean, I mean, it does not. Um, um, <coughs> Sapa proposed building a building over that high so on the west side. Not but, to cut you off, but recall it has to go through the design review process if it were to get incentives. So it's not to say that could never happen. We're just saying that the city wouldn't incentivize that unless it went through the design review process, which means we have to have public input. You really think support. the city was going to tell Sapa no? Sure. Yeah. The, 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 it doesn't happen. Citizens. The, the only reason that didn't happen is because they didn't get the grant they wanted. Yeah, the choice grant. But, but right now at 816, um, they purchased two big properties. And they're talking about lofts, like Pache lofts or something, of course. Yeah, lofts. Mm -hmm. 
and that's that's right under that's right on uh, Colorado and Guadalupe, mm -hmm. and they purchased those lots. And they want to build on high rise. They want to build a high rise. Okay, so can we go back to that? I want to finish this slide because I know you have to leave. Um, I want to make sure everybody's aware. Of this. So the for sale products, capped at 360. We have a federal guideline we can track that with, um, but that prohibits the 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 ultra luxury condos like the artist residence and others from getting the incentive. Did you work with any developers on developing this project? Yes. This policy? Yes. Okay. Um, which communities have you met with to get into on this? We, well, we've met with several. We met with, this is new okay. as um, of the conversation with B Session. Okay. And so okay. we met with a lot of developers who want to make sure that they can develop something. Okay. Um, so we, we have talked to the development community, the nonprofit community. Okay. And then we're meeting with the neighborhood association. Okay. Not the nonprofit community, the for profit community as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think it would be, um, I would really like to see more public input on this, mm -hmm. um, especially since the city is taking input from the development community. Um, I like that you're putting a cap, but even 360 is very high, um, especially for parts in the um, different levels, in level one, in level two, especially, that's really high. But, um, well, that's a cap. It doesn't mean they can't sell it for less. And that's, so right. this goes back to, this is an economic development tool. This is right. not an affordable housing strategy. And so we and we're want, looking at all the downtown regional center areas. But, but, but there's a concern that this is an economic development for the people that live there now. Mm -hmm. It's actually a sort of tool for displacement, mm -hmm. if you look at it from that lens. Right. So, for example, the, the units across the street from Anissa would have been eligible still under this Yes, because they're a little bit less than that, but it's but you it also to, demolished multiple houses. Yeah, and you go into an area like the West Side, and this could be disaster. I mean, right. this really yeah. could be well, difficult. The, the, irony, the irony of it is that the reason that those areas are deteriorated is because of public policy. All of the areas in Tier 2 were previously redlined areas, mm -hmm. right? Right. so they're completely, right. completely denied any kind of investment for most of the 20th century, which meant that the values are incredibly low. So we just set this up, right? We set this up through policy, and now we're going to come back in with policy. Um, and I think a lot of people's fears is not as much, not as much the, the tier one, but in the tier two, when it goes into the neighborhoods, we've created this perfect storm. And it's not just an e a natural economic process. We actually created this um, so that those places now are so devalued and then we, we add incentive dollars so for, for this kind of redevelopment, could, it could result in tremendous displacement. And not just, you know, not just house by house, but because of the externalities that are going to be involved in the whole process. But I want to remind, this, the policy doesn't, does not incent displacement. So if there is housing there already, and someone's living there? Oh, no, I know it, but through externality. Yeah, yes. so I just want to make sure direct yeah, no, I, I we're not that. doing that. Yeah. But with, I don't know if this is practical, but what would make more sense is that the cap be reflective of what the current value of the neighborhood properties are. So mm -hmm. if you're building five units for 290000 that you're going to sell them for, but they're next to a bunch of single-family homes that are worth only 180000 which we see in a lot of other neighborhoods, um, that that's going to drive up the values in the area, which is going to lead to displacement. In the area. So it's very, like 360 is not high for King William, but it is very, very high for most of the west side. And so that basically means any development is a luxury development in that area. And it's also my understanding that the Neighborhood Housing Services Department is working on a displacement policy, which was a recommendation of the Mayor's Housing Policy Framework, but that it's not completed yet. And I just, I'm not really sure how we can have confidence in this before having seen that. Um, well, this, I, and I want to stress, like, the displacement policy. For this one, this is not, this would not allow someone to buy an existing apartment complex, kick people out, and renovate and build a new market rate housing. We would not allow that. But that was not the only way displacement I know, happen. but I just want to make sure that we're clear on that, that that's not, the policy will not incite. Yeah, I think we I think we understand that. I think it's more concerning that I think the concern is that when these new properties are being built, say it's built on a piece of vacant property, that's fine. Um, except for if it's 
a very expensive, it's going to raise the land value of the properties around it, which as we all know, all we, any, any homeowner in Texas knows, when our property values go up, our taxes go up significantly, and that's when you're going to start having displacement, or you're going to have um, owner-occupied housing that is, now they're very stressed because they can't afford to keep up their home because their tax bill is so high. And that's where it's going to it's going to create displacement indirectly. Mm -hmm. um, so would you rather not have incentives for any for sale product? No, I didn't say that. I, did, I would rather have some more community input on what this policy and program should look like. Um, and, and like Sharice said, some, something that's more reflective of the individual community and not just a blanket policy for the city. Um, and and I do think since the city did take the time to get input from the development community, they should give the same respect to their citizens. I do want to stress that I did have a meeting with this group early on, and I offered to go to each one of your neighborhood associations. Okay. I have done that. and I've But not for input. No, I did, and I incorporated some of the input you, you, you gave me. But I also heard that... I just well, want to, I mean, I want to make sure. Right yeah. So I, but I do want to so say, that I know, <laughs> so, but I want to stress that like, you just, for you to say that we didn't have any input is incorrect because I did meet with the groups. We met with, we offered to go to every neighborhood association. We met with several neighborhood associations. We did take input. So No, I know okay. you did, and I'm not saying that you didn't. I'm saying that we need more time and we need more community input. I'm not saying you didn't give input. I mean, you had someone come to Toby Hill, we met before. I know that you have made a lot of effort to meet with various neighborhood associations, but I think that um, we have some recent very good examples of uh, community input, um, like with the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force, um, and I think that that would be something that would be beneficial here. Um, I also know you mentioned that there have been two studies done. I was wondering if I could get information on those studies. Um, will we attach to the B session memo tomorrow? Okay. And so they'll be available online. We've made them public already, but they'll be readily available tomorrow. They're part of the legislature. Um, okay. Great. I think this, so we can pull this down. is new, and I, I'm glad it's there because it wasn't there, but it's not what I shared with my <clears> neighborhood because it, it didn't exist before. So I'm, I, we're actually meeting tonight and I'm going to share it. Um, but I, I do think. So knowing what the, the Cedar Street townhomes, for example, are going for, that, oh, okay, this, this makes sense. But knowing what the, the buildings right across the street from Anissa's house, which were substantially less than that, um, but completely changed the dynamic of that street because there are suddenly six very uh, imposing structures in a place where there was just one before. So having something that's more reflective of a neighborhood, even though that's a lot more work, it makes sense because I, I mean, as you know, I, something that's worth five hundred thousand in one part of the city would get you. Now, <laughs> was, what, was whatever was across from the so we've made that change. But if I may add, I mean, and everybody else, mm -hmm. we all got the poorest mm -hmm. census, right. so it is scary for us. And Christine, you made a good point about what you talked about. Um, we barely survived. I mean, this would not fit at all. And that's why it's got to be reflective of the community, because and the community on West Side has very different limits or a very different situation right. than even Tobin Hill or Mickey Park. Or and I'm going to have to talk to my residents here soon, telling them this right here. So where on the West Side, so within this? Level two. In this area right here. Um, yeah, and, and, I, and one of your slides which we skipped, um, okay. but it was about the expansion of the TSA's downtown campus. We are so nervous on the west side about that because, I mean, as you state, uh, they're expecting additional 11,000 students, 1,500 faculty and staff. There's no way those people are going to keep themselves just to downtown proper. And we're right next door to that. And and you said that displacement happens in all kinds of ways. And I really want to stress that because um, sometimes displacement happens because you know you're trying to increase educational access. But the um, the unintended consequence of that was forcing people out of the neighborhood they've been in for generations. Mm -hmm. um, and and again, I think this displacement policy needs to be hashed out publicly before 
we move forward with this. There's just now, too much at stake. The um, UTSA, when we went forward, we did require them to do a displacement plan before they move forward with phase two. And so that is a requirement. But there also wasn't a lot of community input. I heard that was a backdoor deal. It wasn't a backdoor deal. Oh, oh, take it the way it is, right? No. I, I walk, I do outreach in the community. I do a lot there. My councilwoman, I'm gonna be honest with you, I I've never heard anything. My association never heard anything. And it's just one of those things where how come we didn't have input for that? Yeah. So we can at least be a part of it because downtown is one of our boundaries, this boundary that doesn't have you know, I mean I think Lori, I'm sorry, but that's the that's the feeling that I felt dis we feel disrespected that we weren't told anything. There was zero community input zero. from the west side with UTSA, zero. And, to, and just two weeks ago, we demanded a meeting with the president and got it. And, and he openly said, I don't understand what the concern is. And I don't know anything about this area. And I don't even know you guys existed in this area. And I'm not making that up. That's <laughs> it's no clue. It's it's no clue. No. Um, and um, I mean, that, that's the way our community is being treated. So it's so important that there be more community outreach and then that it happen in the evening because people are at work right now. Mm -hmm. This is a really difficult time. Three o'clock is fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Cynthia went to go get my son because they're just across the street at Fox Tech, but um, this is a really difficult time uh, for anybody who's working for, you know, this, this is like, I'm sure convenient if like it's your job. So, you know, you're at regular business hours, but for most of us, this is actually a really hard time. Um, and, and all our previous meetings were held in the evening, but just, you know, trying to quickly get something on. We're going to have it. We can have it. Right. Meeting. We're not trying to. I'm no, sorry. I'm, I'm, I was trying to just react to get a meeting. Yeah. And yeah. so, I, but I'll, have, I'll stay as long as we want, and we can have more meetings in the evenings. If we yeah, can that, I think that would be great. Because I, um, I don't think anyone's trying to discount what you've done. I think we're saying we just want more. Um, more opportunity for our communities to have input. Mm -hmm. With all due respect, don't speak for me. What I'm saying is, I'm going to put it on the table. It's, okay. it's hard times for us right now on the West Side. Yeah. We, we barely can keep ourselves afloat. And here we come with the 360 uh, hey, I mean, we could never make that money in ages. Right? And I have, to, I have to say that because I'm here for our residents, and we're struggling. And, and I, I'm doing this voluntarily, so I'm not even work a part of that part, right? So for me, it, it's different because of the poor census box. I'm going to say it again. $12,000 for a family, you know, it, 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 I, I just have to say that, you know, because it's not, we're all, we might be the same, but we're not the same. I think it's a situation like the West Side. So a developer can come in and build a bunch of townhouses and sell them for 150,000. Mm. And there, which would not be surprising in some of the West Side, especially like close as you get to Lone Star area where the prices have gone up, they, they would easily do that. They would get all the incentives. But by doing that, they displace everybody in the neighborhood no. that have been there for generations. And that's not exactly true. We will be, we have been demolished yeah. when we shook hands for a family who was displaced. Yeah. So our situations are always different. L Lori, and I invite you for a tour on the West Side. I've, I've done tours. And well, I can give you my that. personal tour. But what I'm saying is, uh, it's different. So nobody speaks for the West Side, as you know the West Side, because I live, I was born, and our residents are hardworking people who are passionate about what we do. <coughs> so, you know. so, so, just, Amaya, so what we got on the West Side is we have poorest people in the city living on the most valuable land. Mm -hmm. And that's an incredible irony. Mm -hmm. um, and because this is an economic development policy and not a, not a housing policy, uh, it makes complete sense that, that we would want to use that land for highest and best use. Well, we, but, we built San Antonio. But, we're, but I want to stress we're looking at if it's only zoned appropriately. And so is so what's, yeah, the, so what's to stop someone from speculatively rezoning their so property before they sell it? We've said that, we made that ineligible. If you have to rezone... No, before they sell it. Maybe before they 
So if no, if we have it, if it was rezoned within the past, we're we're doing five years from single family. It can't be redeveloped. It, it, it does not okay. be It was uh, since 2016. That's what it was. So if you've rezoned your property from single family since 2016, you're not eligible. Ah, this is zoned on that three. It's right. right. appropriately right now. Right. And we were told, I said that yeah, they're gonna get around to a to another big blanket zone, but it's gonna be years because they don't they, they, they don't have the capacity to, to do all of these large cases. Um so but if lots, there's a single family dwelling already on it, oh yeah, then so that's then it's an eligible for So you so we have that in there as well. So if the existing use is single family. Okay. Yeah, despite the zoning. Yes. Okay. Okay. That way, and I and I appreciate like you thinking ahead on a lot of these. Yeah. And I think I think a lot of the a lot of the question is coming in as far as not the one for one displacement, but more the, the externality driven displacement. And I wish that we had a really a better understanding of that process in some of these places. Because when we think about UTSA, you know, I automatically in my head go to UT Austin. And UT Austin is surrounded by old, beautiful neighborhoods that, you know, some of the housing stock actually looks like the West Side. But it's it's all student divided up housing, right? So that's how vulnerable those areas are. Um, same thing around the Capitol is all old neighborhoods and are now no residential whatsoever. Um, so there's the UTSA thing, but then there's also just that the externality of new construction and how is that? Like, can we can we figure out? Can we determine? How, how is that impacting? I know you've done economic development studies. Steve Niven is the best in town, but he did an economic development study, right? And we haven't looked at some of these, some of, some of the externality and social impacts of it at all. And those are things. What UTSA is, they'll be looking at that for their. Is there a way to delay this until we get all of the results of the studies to see what has happened since 2012 when CHIP was first? Well, so, when I think that. A lot of the neighborhoods where CHIP has been successful um, economically have been really destabilized in the last few years, and I think it would be interesting to see what um, what kind of impact that has had on the community and um, besides the economic impact. So right now we are proposing to take this to council uh, next Thursday, and so we'll be going to a B session, and then we'll have a public hearing, and we'll go to council. I would like to take both the fee waiver and the CHIP program. Um, and so that we're, we're not changing the schedule at this point. Um, we're going to continue to do some more briefings. Um, and we're meeting with more stakeholders on this. But the displacement and the affordable housing strategy is coming after. And as I mentioned, the SA Tomorrow plans, you're not eligible for any incentive until you've gone through that regional planning process. Right. I mean, is there. What is the rush? Like, why do we have to take it in the next, you know, week to four weeks to council instead of waiting until we can see what the impact has already been? We have had no development in downtown since we've got a moratorium. No housing. development, or or has it has there, it just not been incentivized? No, there been, has it there's there's no housing incentive, housing projects that have come through, and it's on the books at this point since this project has gone through the moratorium. Everything that's under construction already had an incentive package where everything has gone through council. So it hasn't gone, it, it ha we have had development that went through council, yes. it just didn't go through as of right. Mm -hmm. Since this is an as of right program, doesn't it make sense to take our time to make sure that we have it right before we implement it instead of putting it through and then trying to retroactively see if everything's okay. I think no, it would be I think that wiser to hold off on this, continue to let projects go through council, which they have been all year going through council, um, and, and hold off on the as of right program until we know that it is aligned with the whole city, including the community members. And, and staff believes it is. And we've been going through public input for the past six months. And so um, we will continue to do that. And and we have not, right now, it's still planned to go to council um, next Thursday. But it's, who's to say that that it's not perfect? I'm saying, I know it's, nothing's perfect. But we have gone through quite a bit of public input over the past several, um, six months. So I went to date. 
with all due respect, I want to I want to say there's a difference between a briefing and public input. And I think you know this is a briefing. Our meeting before was a briefing. Um, when uh, someone came to our community association, it was a briefing. But we were given information, but we didn't have enough information to even know what questions to ask. Um, and I feel like now is the time for public input, which is different. That's when we give you feedback, and that <coughs> feedback is considered. Um, this isn't public input. This is a briefing. I think that this is a culmination of several public input efforts that have been going on through SA Tomorrow. We've been present at all those meetings. Um, How is this meeting advertised? Because to my knowledge, which just meeting? this this, this meeting well, that this we're at, because specific. we were just invited, this, this is just for public. you all. This is just for you all to, to get more targeted public input. We have been having several stakeholder meetings individually because there are different needs. So who are the stakeholders cities. that you've been meeting with individually? Um, the nonprofit community. So we've met with um, all the, the nonprofits, both for profit okay. and not for profit. So, so I would say that the community are stakeholders as well. So we've had yes. this, this is the second official meeting that was very specifically invited. It's not a public meeting. Mm -hmm. um, the expectation is that we would then take it to our community for more feedback. And I think the feedback we're giving you now, at least mm -hmm. some of us, is that this is very rushed because there's some significant complications that could come out of this that need to be addressed, such as the displacement specifically related to UTSA. And thank you, because I had thought about that. Uh, but and, and how the displacement's going to affect the community should this program as it is go into place. I think it's a good program, and on paper it looks fine until I start to look at certain neighborhoods. And so my recommendation representing my community would say, hold off. We need to find out what the impact is going to be in these specific areas mm -hmm. before we start incentivizing more projects. Particularly when the Mayor's Housing Task Force um, and now CAP's study on vulnerability both ask for impact studies before we start right. this. And exactly. so what, that's six months? And I know that's, you know, there are other things involved, but there is a fear, I mean, that things that look positive in our experience for neighborhoods often have had disastrous results. And we think of them later as unintended consequences, but they aren't so unintended when we keep bringing them up and then they don't, you know, no one pays attention to them. So, And there seems to be the rush, and we keep uh, putting to the side what Soto is working on, and they should be done together, and they're not. And unfortunately, they're not going to be done. And but this, could this one be slowed down to get caught up with the affordable housing? At right? the detriment of downtown development and economic development? Uh, yes. But I don't, I don't think that that's yeah, detrimental. The thing is, it, it, there has been development in the last year. It just had to go through city council. It wasn't as of right. It wasn't as quickly. But that allowed more public input, and I don't think that's a bad thing. And if we're going to put an as of right policy back into play, it needs to be right for everyone. Mm -hmm. Can is That's that, the feedback our community is giving. Is it a well. possibility that that level, yeah, that level two could be, that part could, we could work on an impact study and level one, which is the downtown? I need to better understand the impact study, because we've already committed to doing an impact study for UTSA. That is a project that has dollars. We, we, we understand what's happening there, so you can do an impact study. It should never. Um, now, okay. Not have it to me. When are they doing it? I don't know. It's, okay. They said now, Kev, who they were talking about that he was trying to he find. He was going to have a meeting with them. Okay. Uh, and now they're saying, saying it's a new. I thought that's what he. I thought that's who they were meeting with. I thought that's who he said. He, he said they two had a preliminary conversation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So why can't we have a, a hold on that until the impact study is done? So the feedback yeah. was that we need to have an impact study because there's. There's two different issues going on. You have an affordable housing strategy and you have an economic development strategy. I hear what Not you're saying, Christine. Housing, I like economic development. It is. And so but there's and, and the economic development strategy addresses some affordable housing. So there are components in here that help support affordable housing. Um, the economic then then the affordable housing will be all about affordable housing that'll have those several those tools. Laurie. Look at me. What is your I'm I've been working on this for nine months, but I have a been running, running with this because of this place. What is your So I'm trying to. So I'm asking. Thank you. I hear you. So 
Christine, I hear you about the, the tier one, tier two. We'll look at that. We need to do a better job of explaining how these issues will not, like the, the single family changing to, um, <coughs> to rezoning and how that's not eligible. An existing um, condition preserving that, because um, that is something that we will be including. Um, we hear your concerns about the affordability that the definitions we're using. We have higher levels of affordability that requiring in level three, so all the regional centers, there is still a 60% requirement in tier two if you're using affordability to, to qualify. Um, but we are allowing flexibility for some of those affordable units to go up to 80% that just recognizes where the market is, where they're at, so that these projects can actually work. And the view from our office is that it's better to have some affordable units built into projects rather than being located out of the city. Who knows where they would go? So we are trying to create, continue that momentum for downtown development, which is important. We'd rather, much rather, and the policy reflects that, we'd much rather have downtown housing units because all of our infrastructure is downtown. We constantly hear, we get into other issues, transportation, all the dollars that go for that. The more housing units, which was part of the SA Toronto efforts, that we can locate in the downtown area, that's what the community wants, and that's what this policy is trying to do. But then not, you know, trying to bring some of those housing developments with an affordability criteria into them where it's possible to do that. Um, I understand that the level one area doesn't have an affordability requirement right now, but it's very difficult. And Lori at B session shared a lot, which was something that was asked of, of our office, of our city, you know, show us the analysis that staff did. So she's done that and shown the dark gaps. We've had many people review those analyses and confirm they're probably too conservative. So we know that projects in this core are more difficult. So what we've done is included a bonus, a carrot, if you will, to try and get some of those projects to add affordability. That's what this program is doing. It's continuing to create housing units where they make the most sense to create them and try and bring more of those units to an affordable level. We've also added the tier three area, or the level three, which brings that 60% requirement, which we've been asked over and over again to look at, and that's a requirement in all of those regional centers. You will not get incentives unless you do that. And we've heard from all your groups, all the stakeholders, residents that we've met with, um, and let me say that the C-CHIP has been on hold, like I said, it's been on hold for a year, but the C-CHIP concept is not a new concept. It's been around since 2012. So what we've done is try and take an existing program that's been on hold for a long time, understand what the requirements from the community are today and try and add those and build those into the policy but at the end of the day still have a policy that developers can actually use i don't so think it's a lot of goals that we're trying right. to meet all in one policy so we hear you i think me by myself when i met with you the last time mm -hmm. it's not a community input meeting mm -hmm. there were several other meetings that did not have a lot of people in it mm -hmm. i don't know that does i represent a community, but those people need to be a part of it too, right? Like the residents, not, not just me by myself, sitting with Lori Houston and other people. Mm -hmm. In the middle of the day, coming in to, um, had to volunteer that time, you know, get away from work, and I was here by myself. Mm -hmm. When we asked, we did reach out, we to those meetings and asked, can we come to your neighbor associations? Mm -hmm. Can we come and talk to you all? You had really specific limits on when you could come to. Which I understand. You, you no, were we extended it after that because okay. we said no because you all were like, no, no, no. Then we extended it because it was supposed to go to council. Yeah, October. you wanted to do it for like two weeks. And, and so. We, he's coming up. That no, so and so we extended it for that to do to do more. I think, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, so <laughs> maybe we can talk about different topics. So level three is, if I understand, kind of put on hold until those plans. Level are three will be adopted by council, but you will not be eligible okay. for the so, incentives until your land use plan is adopted. And right? level one is really the the real, real downtown urban core. Those aren't really neighborhoods, if I'm looking at the map correctly. I mean, some of the borders, Lavaca, they kind of been founded by the highways. I don't Anything think in white is not in Right. Well. But I don't think, so level one, I don't think is that big of a concern. I think most of us would agree that housing prices in that area are expensive already. It's level two where there needs to be more discussion. Can those you are all circle that, those areas for me? Well, the level all two, the level, all, all level two, two, the level two over on the east side, like it's coming it's up to government the hill and the west board. Yeah, everything red. 
that's a level two. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's or everything not, pink. That's everything, level so two. the yeah. only yeah. thing that's eligible is pink. Yeah, that's the perfect. Yeah, so all, basically all of the pink area, I would say there needs to be a hold because all of those areas, just about all of those areas, this is, this is like the side along the river, but that's, that's Lone Star. Actually. So this is Lone Star, that's, we're trying to figure out what properties we're referring to. So I think you can take out, I mean, Lone Star, okay, the big commercial properties like Lone Star, okay, but... Pretty much everything that's east of, or west of um, I-10 there, I-35, mm -hmm. and that's east of I-37, that's the Gnoody Hill, Denver Heights area. Well, Lupe Street, Creel Street, Laredo Street. Yeah, and then and then that's just in that, well, that looks like the pro. So, okay, so let's start on the west side real quick. The whole if you're looking at west of Creel Street, if you're inside Creel Street, that's not particularly housing along Houston Street headed south, right? You do have some apartment complex that are coming up here. Mm -hmm. So would you say anything that's along There's Rio no Street? In there. Correct. But it's not about just the neighborhood. Because, I mean, we... But so you we also have a, you're saying that you're... Right, you, you also know, have a separation of railroad track. Level two, until we can have those impact studies done to see what the displacement has been, what we need to do to offset that. So, so past level one, this is not meant to be an attack on your work. This is a no, good I'm policy. Not it that way. This is this not hurt we want to hurt areas. We don't want to hurt areas either. We want and we want to support the policy, but we want it to be a, a policy that we can support, and that's going to be good for the community as well. And and I'm not speaking for any community but my own. But I will tell you that um, I think that it would be wise to wait for level two areas to have that impact study done um, so that we know what impact CHIP has already had on communities, um, not the economic impact, but the impact on residents. I don't know if we're doing an impact study. We're not doing an impact study on these areas. We're, the doing, only impact we're study doing the is regional the center plans. Correct. Well, then so we, we, need to, we need to. We need to find out displacement, community dynamics. There's a lot of different elements that are being affected in these communities. Um, and I get, as you said, so level one, I, I mean, I think most of us would agree that's probably okay to move forward. But level two, anything you do there is going to have a significant impact on the immediate neighborhoods adjacent to it. And so I'm mean, definitely here. This is a huge neighborhood that's been hugely impacted. Uh, just uh, just one west of Pearl Lane Street. Yeah. the Lone Star neighborhood, they've been hugely affected by development. Um, and so we need to have some real figures to show what's happening there. Right. And I mean, like, the Pearl, it's obviously, everyone is aware of the Pearl and what the Pearl looks like, but all of that development has had a huge ripple effect on Tobin Hill in the neighborhood right, here. right adjacent to the Pearl. So, you know, it's easy to say, oh, well, yeah, that's the Pearl, we can just, we'll just continue to develop that. But it, it really does have an effect on the neighborhoods around it. Um, so I think that's why, you know, go, go forward with level one, but for the level two areas, can we just slow down and get more, you know, have a public meeting where community can come and really understand this? Because I think one of, one of the challenges is, is this is high level. You guys have spent months and months working on this, and this is what you do every day, all day long. And then you present it to us and expect us to understand it and take it back to our communities. And even when we spend time looking at it and ask lots of questions, we don't understand it like you do. So we can't take it back to our communities in the same way. So it takes us a lot longer to catch up and figure out what are the questions we have. What does this mean for us? What is this going to look like in my neighborhood? Does this even affect us? Well, it does, and it's taken us this time. And so we're asking if you could slow down so that we can catch up to you and, and so that we can understand and so that also you can understand um, what the community has to say. And, you know, there's a lot of people in my community that have a much different background than me, that have a better education than me, um, that understand the neighborhood better than me, and, but they can't be here. So I'm here. <laughs> you know, so we have to, we have to work together. And, and I think we need time and opportunity for those people to come get their questions answered and to give their input. One good <laughs> example, excuse me, one good example to help them understand what we're talking about, where for the housing task force, when they held their meetings, the, the input meetings, 
uh, the one that had uh, in current word had 200 people mm -hmm. and there was a dialogue that went on and we were at those meetings so and we but people the meetings. neighborhoods feel better when we have that opportunity to hear you and to talk with you and you to talk to us and to more people I, mean, I think uh, that you know you look at this and you think okay if I were you I'd be like what is wrong with these people what is wrong with the revitalization like no, we're trying I, I, I do want you to know I, I no, understand, the, I understand. The, the challenge and I look at this and I think revitalization you know if this had been me 20 years ago I'm like wow that's revitalization that's going to help that community the problem is all of us have been on the ground and that's never how it works out for us like things that should <coughs> work or looks good like this you find your neighbors can't stay in their homes. You find developers coming in, and for them, it's not community, nor should it be. They have a job, it's a bottom line. And and whatever they do for that bottom line, that's what they do. Well, for us, it's for community, and then we have six three-and-a-half-story condos right next to your single-family bungalow in Beacon Hill or across the street in Tobin Hill. Or I mean, all of us could have those examples. And so we're products. Our thinking is often products of worst-case scenarios because that's often what these produce for us. And so, I mean, the idea of, of needing to assess, like, for the most vulnerable neighbors, neighbors who hung on to redlining, who, who have, have, you know, created cheap land prices. I know if they moved, we'd, those tax bases would go up. I know economically, maybe displacement's not a bad thing from a, from a perspective. But for us and for our neighborhoods, they're disastrous. And we need to study the effects of that before we go on. And, and we're, we're also running out of places for people to go, you know, I mean, like, yeah. Amelia said she had, they live in the poorest zip code in the city. Well, we know that our city has the poorest zip code in the nation. So if that's the poorest zip code in the country, where will they go if they're displaced? Where will they go? There's literally nowhere less expensive for them to go. Nowhere. Way out in the suburbs. And then well, cost per not even in the suburbs. Yeah, you know, there is, um, listening to this, and looking at that three hundred and sixty thousand dollar unit, right? The, 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 that's the cap. There's a new tool that Saha is kind of testing out. Coming, it's coming down from HUD, and what? And it's much, and it uses a much more localized AMI. Have you seen this? But no. In some of these areas, it's capped at blank. In tune with this new tool that's being developed, so Richard Milk is, is like our point person locally. Then it's then it may be you know you may be then developing a really interesting policy and tool that's much more sensitive to the to what's already on the ground, um, and I think and I don't know I just well, I want to plant the idea of looking at that as part of this I do agree with the, the citizen input this is just another kind of another recommendation as far as thinking about the tools that you've got available to you. Um, and making them a lot more, a lot more, um, uh, almost micro responsive to what's to what's there. In you know, thinking about the displacement issues, thinking about the externality issues. If I'm going to build something that's three hundred sixty thousand dollars next to these houses that are now sixty thousand dollars, what's going to happen to the little houses? And we all know that. Um, but if I build something that's $140,000 next to the $60,000 house. That's a very different scenario. Okay. Um, so we are still planning on doing a B session next week regardless. Um, and then I don't, we are still proposed to go on Thursday, but if things change, we'll let you know. Um, can you tell me the names of the studies or who did the studies that you can have? GXP. And they're in your PowerPoint there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then and the number of the economic data. Okay. And, and that's the they're available on the right where and keep my we'll 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 study or we will send them to Barbara and she can send them out to this group, yeah. but they're available. Okay. 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 Next week. Yes. Okay. The 12th and 13th. 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 12th and 13th
that oh, Wednesday nice. night. That oh, okay. and then so we're in session. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I do appreciate the changes that you've made since the first time we met here. Because um, I, I have noticed like some of these are different, and I can tell that you're taking into consideration what you're hearing. Um, and the community appreciates that. I appreciate that. Um, so I, I, I feel confident that if we can just take our time and really read the policy, that's going to be good for everybody. I mean, not that this isn't good, but I think if we could really tell it up, I'm not trying to say. <laughs> I, I want to go to my neighborhood association and argue for this. And I want to call my council person and say, you need to pass this. As it stands, I'm about 75% there, but I have some reservations, so I, I can't say that right now. So. No, but I'm also hearing, though, tier one, you're fine. Level one, uh, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I just say we're fine. But I don't, I, I mean, looking right, at. You can't speak for that area. Right? Well, I live right now, I live adjacent to, to level one, um, and uh, my neighborhood is adjacent to it. So my neighborhood is the most affected. And I'm looking at the neighborhoods around there, those are already pretty well developed. Um, so I don't think that the 360 cap is a problem in, the, in level one. And the general incentives that you're going to have in level one, given the kind of development that's already there, will not have that much direct impact. It's level two, where you already have it, then a lot of that stuff that borders level one and level two is commercial already or multi unit areas. It's when you get just past that. So that's why I have a problem with level two. Level one, I think, is, is doable. I, I wouldn't argue against it, let's put it that way. I'm not going to. Champion. Just, I feel the same way. I feel yeah. the same way. Like, um, yes, basically. Right, but I believe they're inside. They are just, level one. They're, they're, right, level one. they're just outside level one. They're, 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 they're right here. Just, I still think you should meet with them because they're they're directly they're direct adjacent, adjacent to it. Yeah. Um, so they'll mm -hmm. have that right that impact. And Soapworks wasn't a. Uh, they didn't receive any incentives. No. So even can I ask a question about the safety waiver? Like right now, as it is, anything goes provided you're within the 84 square mile area. So, do you all support moving forward the amendment to the city program, which are banning type twos, um, limiting it to the use versus the the 84 square mile? The 84 area. square mile. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, four categories. So, yeah. my, my other question on that was, you said that Renee was still working on the business development, like. And I'm sure that'll be fine, but I would say I want to see that before, because probably it's fine. It seems fine what you presented, mm -hmm. but without that business development piece, it's, you can't say yes to everything. We haven't seen it. And what our policy would say is that piece would be as whenever theirs is effective. So it wouldn't be effective until he So we're not passing. Is, he's doing his tax abatement guidelines and everything is part of it. But if this is passed, and then once he's done, then what happens? To go back through council. They have to go to council. Okay. For his to pass for those rules. Yeah. Okay. So this would just impose the limits on it. Yeah. 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 And so we went forward with the fee waiver program and then we're gonna I'll look at some of the discussion we had about tier level one versus level two and level three. Um, as far as that I think that or the fee waiver program, I think that it looks good. My my only concern is um, using the MSA AMI as opposed to the city AMI, and maybe if we could look at the tool that Christine mentioned, or um, something like that, or, or, or even adjusting what we instead of doing. We, we looked know, very hard at that. We we had very deep discussions with our, our nonprofit communities who I've been working with for about sixteen years. They can't finance a deal without those HUD rents. Okay. Everything is based on those HUD rents. Then would know, it be possible tax to look credit. at I think what we're asking is, is we know that you have to use the MSA fund figures. That's mm -hmm. fine. We use the 60% instead of the 80 because right. the 60 yeah. aligns with 80 and even 100% for the but, city. But, right. But, but it would be lower required. Of, we, right. still want, we still need some workforce. We still need that 80. 
And like eighty percent is almost one hundred ten of AMI. Eighty HUD, then it's not one percent. Eighty percent is helping uh, a teacher, a fireman. We still need that type of work. We still need that housing product in downtown. Eighty. So that's eighty percent of. We're talking local about a family of four making sixty six thousand dollars a year combined. That's two 100%. households. That's 100%. Those are, right. those are that's two. That's a husband and wife making, or a, a couple making $33,000 a year each. We're not saying, we're not saying making, just, we're not saying asking us for people to make more money. We're saying make it, make the requirement be more restrictive to ha providing more affordable housing. What, like, what so occurs in that Lowering situation. it to like the max. Price for sale instead of being 120% AMI or below, make it 100% AMI or below. Mm -hmm. um, instead of the multifamily being um, half at 80% and half at 60%, make it be half at 60% and half at 30%. But we're asking the, for you to. The, okay, the, how the math works, if we're providing an incentive that might be worth, what's the, the amount? $200,000 in, in incentive. For a reduction in rents from a, an eighty percent down to a fifty or thirty, it doesn't justify the incentive. They would not use the tool to begin with. So all we're doing is removing the ability for them to use the tool in the first place. It's just not cost effective. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get them to be able to utilize this tool. And if we're saying that uh, these affordable housing developers. That they are they're they're bound to, to try to go after the tax credits, the home dollars, where all the big money are for the affordable housing. We want to layer this ICRIP program to give them the extra two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand for that. This yes. is a piggyback. Totally get this that. This is this is not to drive. I totally get that, but, but this, but the affordable. If if everybody would just get out of the way of, of the affordable housing providers, they can do it. Yeah. Right? They're doing it and they're doing fabulously. It's the for profits that, that you're trying to attract. That we're yeah. trying to attract? Yeah, to, to, to do these kinds of projects. No, we do want, we well, I want more Alamo groups to do these projects. That's right. Yeah, I know it, but that's the thing is that, is, is that they know how and they can do it. Right? right? And, and we're dying to get another another building and, and right. have a job get it. The no, I get I know that. Right. And they know how to use these tools. Um, but when I listen to you, it's more, it's, it's the, and you say, well, they'll just opt out. Well, the, the affordables can't opt out. Right. The for-profits are the ones that are going to opt out. But we and still need more rehousing housing downtown. We do. Yes. Yes. And, 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 think we're talking and you about can't, it does not pencil without the <laughs> You have to well, I get, No, I get that. I get that. Um, so the question is, how do you, Kind of if we if we just if we can enable our affordables to do even more to build their their capacity even more you generate some new ones whatever get NHS or yeah NHS off the ground right um, sorry I dealt with it a long time ago sure it's a tragedy it's a tragedy right um, and, but it's it's the it's the, when I listen to you it's it's the for profits that you're thinking about not the non profit but yeah, but you said that they won't take. They won't. It's not that they won't. They won't take, do this, and they'll do their own thing. If they, if, if they're trying to get a tax credit project, four percent, nine percent, or trying to do some sort of deal, yeah. and they have to get the sixty percent or the eighty percent, that's the target for their project, and to get this two hundred fifty thousand dollars, they now have to bring half their units down to thirty percent AMI. It's not going to work financially. It's, it's not, wouldn't do it. They, they can't. It's just not from a pro forma standpoint. I've talked to Jennifer. Yeah. No, they, they're the ones proposing this not yeah. be. Correct. They're the ones saying, good. whatever you do, don't, don't go down to the lower thresholds. They're the ones who are telling us this. And they're still going to do that at or below 30%, yeah. at or below 60 to 50 Correct. in the market. They'll still meet those guidelines. They don't want us to change. They want the HUD and, and even lured us in the housing task force, so they never intended for us to not be in alignment with the HUD. But they're doing what you want, you lower it. 
So right. I get that, but we can't lower it because we, there's still a demand for market rate in downtown. So we're trying to meet both, and you're right, there is affordable housing providers that will do it. And so this, this policy will help us meet both, keep the market rate going, but help us bring on the Alamo groups and others to do more housing. Well, it's, it's an expanded definition of market rate then. Right? So it's, it's, it's market rate, but transfer of market rate, like when you talk about market rate, you're talking about 100% AMI or 80% AMI. I'm talking about higher too. I mean, you still yeah, 80% and higher of MSA's AMI, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is, which is honestly, you know, not upper middle income, but it's higher middle income for the city of San Antonio. Mm -hmm. But we, so if this goes back to the economic development tool, and I'm going to just speak to level one right now. I mean, you have USAA bringing, you know, 2,500 employees downtown. Mm -hmm. um, we have, we were bringing employees downtown. 63% of our housing stock in level one is affordable. We don't have, we have more affordable than market rate online. Now, I'm not speaking to quality. You know, it may not be quality affordable, but we need more market rate stock because USA is coming downtown because their employees want to be downtown. And so, as a result of us creating a vibrant downtown, USA is bringing businesses from Phoenix and other offices in Dallas to the city of San Antonio. And they were saying, we're moving 2,500 people downtown because we did a survey and our employees want to be downtown. And if they're not, if there isn't, that causes more stress on our neighborhoods when they need that housing and it's not provided downtown, right. which is all hotels. And who's downtown? Nobody know. other than hotels. Well, hotels. And that's a problem. And so we need to create yeah. more product like downtown because if you don't, but we can't even afford it. It's not that but right. So the employees, though, it's if a you're talking too. market rate, what's an example of a market rate apartment downtown? And like Pearl has one bedrooms for a thousand, twelve hundred square feet, or twelve hundred dollars a month. You know, okay. So it's anywhere from you know, the average is about dollar seventy-five a foot right now. So a normal, Pearl, right. some are higher. Who's the employee that makes? What kind of salary does that employee need to make to mm -hmm. afford a place like that? And is that the majority of the people that these businesses are bringing? Are they bringing their higher level or are they bringing their yes. lower level? Right now, a lot of the, the downtown workforce are tourism industry who are very much on the low end and they can't afford to live downtown. So the USAs are on the higher level. But also, if I'm cleaning the Valencia, and I have a family of three, and I'm coming in all the time. Right. I would like to the west side. Yeah, I would like to live downtown too, but I won't be able to. But I'm cleaning San Antonio's hotels, right. and I do more because I'm when I do overtime or whatever. But I can't go home at 10 p.m. So you you said that most of the <coughs> residents that we have downtown are lower income. Not most of the residents, most of the units. So we we took all the housing units. Most in of the multi family housing most units. But, in in but you're looking at older most stuff. Right. There right. are many architectural right. engineering firms downtown in Southtown. I'm the only one that lives in Southtown. Everybody lives far away because it's expensive to live here. And I'm also the lowest paid person. Here. <laughs> so have you met with the with the people that currently are living downtown. Well, downtown, on this group, downtown yes, we look. We're about with Centro and several of the, the members there. Central. I'm talking about people that live in those multifamilies that you just mentioned. No, part of the housing. No. Okay. I think going back to ICRIP, was there an issue with ICRIP? I know we talked about the affordability and, and talking about the rates talking about trying to get them down to or mandating that this program reduce it. You know, if if tax credit programs were mandated down and they are the drivers of ten million, twenty million dollars of equity in a project, then we could piggyback off of that and say we're gonna match whatever those tax credit programs are. But we shouldn't be the ones driving the discussion of affordability based on $200,000 in a fee waiver that might be going into a project when it can help that tax credit project. It can help Museum Reach or 
you know, have to have now. So you have to be able to, this has to be flexible. Enough. So I mean, when. Is Habitat building downtown at all? Or no, no, I'm talking about, I, I'm talking about the city okay. fee waiver, so which city is citywide. Yeah, That's okay. the program we're talking about. Um, From what you presented, I think the ICAP looks good. The fee waiver program looks good. Um, I, I wish that there could be a way to bring, well, I mean, basically what, what Christine was asking and what we were saying before. I understand that you need to use the MSA number, um, the HUD numbers for the nonprofit groups, but I wish there was a way that we could make our requirements match up with what our city needs. And, I also and the affordable housing strategy will speak to that more. Um, this was really kind of a, a threshold you must meet to be able to get to the fee waiver. Speaking to Christine's point, you know, this was thinking about the for-profit, like the fee waiver, because mm -hmm. the, the non-profit, they're going to go below this. But this is really trying to get that for-profit developer to do this. To do this. Yeah. For the fee waiver program, yes. yes. Because okay. Um, and, and because the Alamo groups of the world, all, the, all those, they're going to go deeper cuts, and they're going to be mm -hmm. much deeper. But this was just to get someone, okay, if I want to get five, this, four yes, come in. to develop that mixed income. Okay. The ACPIP is looking at, I wish it was more affordable, but mm -hmm. well, it's not. 25% of the units have to be at 60% or below. Okay. I'm just curious, if the displacement policy that is in the works and the affordable housing approach that, that is in the works. If they find themselves contradicting this, what will happen? We've been working closely with Ron Soto, and they have not expressed any concerns about that. And this is a tool they want to fold into that affordable housing strategy. I, I guess it still just doesn't make sense to me that, that, that it wouldn't all happen together instead of piecemeal. Like we would this. see it together. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a piece that's what's lacking here. That's the, the part. You guys are doing a lot of work, you present a lot of information, but there's a huge gap, and that's the affordable housing and the yeah. I, I just, I just worry that they're going to end up not really matching. And I am concerned about the idea that if it's historic or it's eligible to be historic, that they're, and I don't even know how we'd address this, that there's no design standards. You know, I'm, I'm worried that this will be an open door for flippers to come so, in, get the fee waivers, and do, you know, and some of them do fine jobs, yeah. a lot of them don't. We can look, we'll look at that. Okay. okay. I think if you can address that, then I, I feel comfortable saying my neighborhood would support the IPA, um, the fee waiver program. Um, I'm sorry, I feel like. No, see, I mean, see, Chip. But so you said you had not yet met with those residents um, that are in the level one area. Well, we met with several residents, but we've even reached out to the Downtown Residents Association. They have not expressed interest in in meeting any briefings, but we have met with individual property owners. Um, so, yes, we have interest. In we've also attended the Downtown Regional Center. Planning meetings and talking about this right. as well. I just, I guess, I just have a concern now. Like now that you mentioned that, you know, most of the multifamily units are on the lower income. Like, I'm afraid for them. Like if we're going to skip them this place, I don't want to see another sub works, especially one that was well, this, done with so an incentive I wanna, program. It was you know? not done with an incentive. That one no, was I know. I'm saying, but it was I'm saying, I'm saying I don't want the next one to be have and, been done. With and it would program. not allow it. Okay. So this, if it's something like soap works. The Maverick, anything that already has tenants in there, it's not eligible for as of right incentives. That has to go to city council. Okay. So if someone's public. currently living there, it's not eligible. It's not this eligible. Is only for brand new it's not rehabbing it's not tearing so, down. But once there's I mean, you know, and I know that there's got to find some ground in here in between, but I mean the truth is once you have all this development downtown and all this wealthy, you know, great living space, those People are going to be displaced. No one is going to have these small rents if you're running a for profit. They're going to want to change them into something that will get the same kind of rents. And that's right. what they do for a living. And then the that's hotel works. Yeah. But what you see at Soap Works and Center City right now is. This is why 
this is why tax credit programs, affordable housing programs like with the home program are so critical because they have restrictions, long-term affordability restrictions with those investments that, um, that are in place for 15, 20, 30, 35, 40 years, depending on the level of investment that but goes if, in. And but if we also have alternative affordable housing in the downtown area, that will go a lot. I mean, you right. know, maybe that that's lost in the downtown, but, but they'll be at least in the area. Let me sure we still have affordable housing in downtown. I and I, I was ready to go say level one is fine. Yeah, me too. Now, yeah. <laughs> now I'm afraid. Because I would like to see how the current affordable housing in the downtown, you say there's a lot. How are we going to preserve that in well, the face of. Well, in the seed chip, it doesn't allow you to. Like, you could not buy an affordable housing complex right. and convert it. Right. Now, what we're trying to do is we're also recommending separate from the seed chip doing. And disposing of city owned property to build affordable housing in the downtown area. So, we have those are other tools that we're trying to use that are outside of this as of right policy. I so, would you think it's important like to, to know yeah. that, that affordable housing projects, say like Savios Lofts, which has uh, you know, 63 of the units are, are at or below 60% of the AMI, if they were ever to sell that property, it's a tax credit project, it cannot be changed. During the length of that, of the term of those agreements. What I'm talking so about is the same thing we were talking about in level two. So the neighborhood outside Lone Star is not part of the level two, but they're going to be impacted by whatever you do in level two. So now what we're seeing is in level one, like Soapworks, that's not receiving any incentive. They, they're not eligible for any incentive, but I have no doubt that they were directly impacted by the other incentives that are happening in downtown because everything around them is going up, so then that one does too. So what kind of protection do we have on the current affordable housing that it will stay affordable housing and not suddenly go scarce? And most of those people are renters. And there's no protection that we yeah, can necessarily no, offer unless they're we already stop built in. Works from selling. We couldn't stop the development. Right. right. So, but, so maybe we need to look at that and we need to see what the affordable housing plan is that's going to protect those residents before we support that. If Becky say, I want Lori to listen to this. Who here lives in the West Side? Not anymore. Used to. Fiance used to. <laughs> Las Palmas and Lenin. But you're not there now. Not now. Exactly what I'm saying. So before we are here with level one, this is the, the big picture yeah. because it is going to impact. Well, I, yeah, I see that now. Yeah, I was willing to go with level one before, but now I see yeah, it's, 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 it's us behind. This, no, it's the same. I, I know Westwood definitely has this issue. No, I see now that level one is going to have the same oh, yeah. issue that we were concerned about for level two areas. And before we went forward. We'd like to see what affordable uh, housing plan is going to do to protect the people that are currently down there. Because being displaced and being sent to the nether region of San Antonio is going to hugely disrupt the lives. Thank you. We don't want They're to all at risk. Um, I, I, I think the way one. that it is now, we can support high trust and yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's right. Like, uh, but maybe just slowing down the CG process until. The affordable housing piece can catch up to it, so we can see how those they're they're going to work together and make sure that communities are being um, protected and supported through the process. Thank you.